professional and, and uh, service uh, therapy. Like I wrote here, physiotherapy rehabilitation, surgical pedagogy for for youth and uh, hearing impairment uh, or speech impaired children, and uh, and also on the autism spectrum. But what's interesting about this? So they have from kindergarten, primary school, high school, uh, and a vocational center. So they really try to accompany the child all the way into adulthood. That's a really good point to see what happens afterwards. I think it's interesting for us to explore something like that. But so far, most of the systems are only set up until that point of adulthood. And what's also interesting that even though the school is really professional in the way that they deal with special needs, in the community, it's viewed like something where you don't want your child to end up in. It's like, God forbid my child goes to this SA uh, school, because then that means that he or she has serious problems. And with this project, we also want to change the perspective of the community of how they perceive school, this school and how uh, ultimately they perceive children with special needs. Uh, that's, that's the first school that we decided to work with. And the second one is, oh, and these schools are in the south of Hungary, the southeast of Hungary, both of them. The Edmi, the special needs school, and this one, which is uh, a safe school. So it's open to the public, whoever wants to go there. While the previous one, you need a specific diagnosis for you to uh, be accepted in that school. And uh, what's interesting is, even though this is a, a public school, it kind of is undergoing this unofficial segregation because a huge portion of the Roma community in Hungary attends this school. So parents tend to see, okay, do I want my child to be in that center? And it has also this really prejudiced um, approach from, from the local community. So we hope to also change that by bringing uh, an Erasmus Plus project there to kind of uh, let them see that these schools have value and, and they shouldn't uh, discriminate based on what kind of um, people go there, with what kind of needs, what kind of background. Oh, and one more thing, sorry, I forgot. That you can see here that even though it's a public school that accepts all kinds of students, the majority, like 70% of the students in one class actually do struggle with special, ed uh, special educational needs or learning behavioral uh, social disorders, or they are at risk of social exclusion because of their economic uh, situation. And the last school is in Budapest. Um, it's, uh, it also has its struggles because it's in the urban outskirts, uh, low income families, many uh, immigrant families, uh, children go to this school, many with struggling still to learn Hungarian, it's not an easy language, especially, you know, you just have to learn all your classes in Hungarian. So all of these, all of these schools have a, a similar dynamic and at the same time are quite different. And we would like to bring together the students of these three schools in one way or another. Maybe we just have this kind of far from the other two schools, but we are trying to explore uh, how to do that. So what are our ideas? Um, uh, we thought that the easiest way to, to incorporate um, children with different capabilities is through theater. I think um, also Monica and uh, the other gentleman from, from Extremadura mentioned it, that dancing and, and, and theater and this kind of art really can speak to the soul and it doesn't have to use language necessarily. And I think that's a really big benefit. Um, that's why we thought to have an integrated puppet theater show. Um, can I take my mask? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, that's about I just want to make sure. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's why we thought to create a, a puppet theater show. And we showed one of the artists in southern Hungary who's actually a puppeteer and is a storyteller. So the technique that she uses is like this dramatic interactive storytelling. And she would be one of the artists um, carrying the news workshop in the school. And together with her theater troupe or her theater group, they could create uh, a, a puppet show. And the reason, that, the reason that we thought about this idea of puppeteering is because um, when children can have a costume or an object to hold, 
they can ease into the performance much easier rather than getting on stage and <coughs> having the spotlight on them and trying to do something. And the fear of failure may be lessened because they have an object that actually takes the attention. You know, by putting their eyes on the object and manipulating it, mm -hmm. the people's eyes are also going to be on the object and not necessarily on themselves. So that can be a good way for children who might have some shyness to, to also have a role in, uh, in, in the show. And also, uh, we can talk about creating the puppets, so even children who don't feel comfortable going onto the stage, they can help with the costume creation, they can uh, help with the, the visual, the scene, uh, or stage design, they can help with the music, if it's like some clapping or, or rhythmic uh, background or, or soundtrack music. So these are some ideas. And um, the next idea, oh, here was a video of a child doing, who is not speaking, and he's doing a, an object animation with a, a piece of cloth, pretending to be, a, to be a horse. Maybe I can show you later, it's really like 10 seconds long, but I couldn't make it work. So let's see that. which um, is, it has children that I mentioned with, uh, with a risk of social exclusion and also some special needs children in one school to pair them with the Kodai Zoltan Children's Choir School. It's a school that we've worked with and it's quite a prestigious school. With, it, it really comes from like elite families who are um, taking their children to that school to pair these schools together to create a flash mob. So it could be uh, uh, a really impromptu uh, kind of performance in a public square, like maybe one of the most touristic squares in Budapest, and they go there. You, I, I think you, you are familiar with what a flash mob is like. So it's kind of, all of a sudden, it's like a surprise show, and they, they, can, they can be children who choose to sing, they can be children who choose to dance, they can also be children who just uh, accompany with, with clapping or any rhythmic thing, and, and it can involve even live music for some children who are learning to play instruments in the in the music school. So that's the, the other idea that we had. And here I wanted to show um, a video of a flash mob that we've done before. Yeah. 
But these are just some of our ideas that we thought would be useful to share with you uh, after kind of reflecting or analyzing what could work for this project. So the first point is what I've mentioned like a lot of times now, and you might be sick of hearing it, but to include diverse artistic disciplines so that there's something for everyone, a role for everyone, to involve all the different groups, like children, artists, teachers, parents, and the local community, and to put more emphasis on the artistic process rather than on creating a perfect performance. I think it's, it's uh, really important that even in the show, it could be something like a rehearsal. We can say, okay, this is not a, a performance, this is not a show, this is to show you how we can work and, uh, and to get children who are really shy and, and who might not be able to speak perfectly or, or anything, but get them on the stage and to be proud of, of their accomplishment and, and, and responsible for, for their, own, um, their own performance in a way. And uh, some ideas for the venue. So I, I spoke about the flash mob, which could be a really um, informal place just in the middle of the city. Uh, it's, always, it's always good because there's a lot of people uh, around and it gets the attention and, and kind of places these children right in the center, in the, in the eye of, of, of the city, of, of the people of the city, instead of you know, hiding them or, or putting them elsewhere. And other, other ideas could be a performing arts center and also to coordinate the days, the days with maybe some holidays when there's already some kind of events taking place so people have time to go, and not necessarily the school, to, to not make it only open for the school public, if that makes any sense. And, that's it. and what I just wanted to say one more thing, that constantly what I'm questioning or what I'm thinking about is um, how we can do something that really creates a collaboration between the children and the community. Because I think it's one thing to do stuff, to work with the children, and then perform it, but how do we get actually the community to collaborate? Because uh, I don't know if you share this concern or this insecurity with me or not, that uh, even if we do something in one school, it might not transfer, it might not easily transfer with another group because all the music classes are during school hours. So it's not easy to bring another group of children together unless it's like a final performance. I think this is something that we should discuss. I would love to hear your ideas how we can get over this uh, challenge. And one other thing to mention, now that you know what's in the news about the war in Ukraine and we're receiving a lot of refugees, our idea is also to go into the, the shelters where um, refugee children are living like semi-permanently and try to also involve them in, in, a, in a production like this. They might not be open to participate per se, it will be really difficult to coordinate perhaps because of their really uh, volatile situation. They might be leaving in a week or in a month or tomorrow. But I think it would be really important to also have this kind of inclusion for uh, temporary citizens. So thank you so much for your patience.